right, thank you. Welcome to the AMA Expo West. This is exciting to be here. I'm really honored to be here today. I'd first like to thank the AMA staff for their hospitality and putting this together and giving me yet another opportunity to get on this stage and show you some of the fun things we do at Scaled. Um, that is true. I do work on Strata Launch, which is the world's largest airplane. You've probably seen it in the news lately. We're not going to talk a whole lot about that because that's actual work. What I want to talk about today is something that is close to my heart, which is play. <laughs> so let's imagine just for a second, everyone here loves model aviation and we're all here for some model aviation related, maybe even trains or surface, you know, RC. We're here for some reason because we all have a common interest in that. But we have all as a group of people struggled with trying to get participation and interest built so that we can build our clubs up, we can get our flying facilities better, we can try to make our environment more enjoyable and form a sense of community. We tried a little experiment at Scaled Composites and it was mostly a response to what was seen as a problem. So imagine you have a workforce of people at, and every day they take a couple breaks and they come back. They, what happens when you have a break time in your normal work process? And, and this, it could be something as easy as just a project and you stop and take a break. After that break, you have to restart your mind and your body, you have to get back into what you were doing. It's almost as if that break made you more tired, right? So think about that for a second. That's what we're gonna talk about, a way to fix that with the sport that we love the most. So check this out. I'm, just so you know who I am, I grew up in New Mexico and I started building model airplanes with my dad at eight years old. And here's me with uh, our Sky Tiger that we had built together. Um, who here has built a model with one of their parents? Anybody? Yes! This is a tradition that we have to keep alive. I think most of us feel that way, and this is something that I certainly feel very strongly about, and that's kind of why I'm here today. This is me and my dad. We have a tradition in our family. We always cover a model airplane on New Year's Eve, and this is my mom stepped into my room and said, hey guys, New Year's has passed. And we didn't even know that it was already past midnight. We're busy covering a wing for us. I think that was a Sky Tiger wing again. I think we were adding a, a different wing. Tradition is really important in model aviation. And this is what is the glue that binds this hobby together. Of course, I have many people I've looked up to over my years. This is me with Jimmy Franklin. Anyone here know who Jimmy Franklin is? Yes. We got asked when I was a kid to help him try an air show stunt for the first time sort of behind the scenes at his home airport and it just so happened to be next to my home airport and so as a reward for helping him out for a weekend he gave me my dad and I each a ride in his super cub and that's actually Lee Oman standing behind him with a with a tool to, to fix the uh, the airplane with so that's kind of fun. I grew up and got interested in full-scale flight and this is a uh, me with my girlfriend in the back of a, uh, a, 230, a Schweizer 233. I think I uh, took her on our first date. Um, many years later, I married her. A uh, natural process is to get a private pilot's license. So there I am in uh, 18 years old with a pilot's license. Like most of you, I had to get a job to support this hobby. And so I got a job building model rockets, actual scale sounding rockets for research and, and for a uh, contract. So behind the scenes, I'm, I'm the guy on the left. They, had, they eventually made me straighten up. I became the guy on the right for just a few minutes. I had to be serious, but that is me on the left. That's who I am inside. But as I was doing that, I was living in Albuquerque and my dream since I was a kid always was to work at Scaled Composites. I didn't have any skills to get a job there particularly except that I have been a lifelong member of the AMA and I know that Bert Rutan is a lifelong member of the AMA and I knew that if I built the best model I could that would be my best foot forward to say look I may not know how to build a full scale airplane but I know where to start and that's the energy that I tried to capture with this airplane build 
And sure enough, I took this model airplane, two scaled composites on my job interview, and Bert hired me that day. So, and I have never built a real airplane in my life at this point. So uh, this is a cool little uh, ad that Horizon Hobby came, uh, Park Zone actually, when they were brand new, came and took a picture of all the pilots at scaled composites. Engineering naturally has a, an attrition rate associated with it. Engineers like to do projects, finish them, and move on to the next one. Almost every person in this photograph, 11 years later, still works at this company. So keep that in mind as I go through this. So I've never built an airplane in my life. What do they assign me to do? They say, you've got to design the landing gear on White Knight 2. I had no business doing that at all. And they just throw you into the fire and you have to do it. Here's a picture of the day of first flight. And uh, that was a kind of a nerve wracking day. Up in the upper right hand corner, we were building the main gear assembly. And so that's exciting because I, you pick parts from other airplanes as much as you can. And then you have to build some custom fittings to make them fit your airplane. And uh, here's the day of first flight. That's Bert and I laughing about the nose wheel it had shimmied so bad that the, you can kind of, you might be able to see some detail on that tire. It shredded itself. It shimmied going down the runway like a shopping cart. And, uh, and we were laughing at that having uh, torn itself apart. So let's get into this. Why do we build model airplanes? I'm sure you've thought about that, especially when you're trying to explain to someone why you spent that much on that big model or tell your wife while you're going, why you're going back to the shop after being out there for three straight days trying to fix something. Let me make an attempt at defining this. I think we do model aviation for exposure. And that's exposure to several things. First of all, it's exposure to the craft. All of us like building, even ARFs, we're doing some sort of building. We are putting things together, we're checking the fits. I am sure that every one of you here has taken an ARF and modified it in some way or another. That's just how it is. If you crash it, you're modifying it in some way. We also build models for the experience so we can gain that knowledge of the order in which things get done. The experiment. Hey, what if I add more throw to those surfaces? What if I add more power? That's my favorite one is more power always. And uh, what if I add more servos? It's kind of what these example of here. <laughs> so uh, most importantly for me, model aviation is the people, hands down, because without this community, it's just hardware. And we know that that is not part of the attraction. The history, the people, the stories, they're continuing today. They're happening before our eyes. This year, we will have another landmark flight in our history books, the world's largest airplane bigger than anything ever made. That's gonna fly soon, so keep your eyes on the news for that one. So scaled composites had this problem of people flying RC during break time and taking too long at break and not getting back to work. And they started to notice that we were being distracted and we were starting to formulate little leagues and we were going outside and flying and coming back in, you know, Break time's 20 minutes, but we were out for 25, and oh no, now we're out 30 minutes, and it just kind of kept creeping along. So the management said, let's try something. Let's give them that time. Let's give everyone in the company the ability to take a half hour break once a week and compete. So in 2007, we started a, a little internal league, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about today is what does this do to your company? What does this do to your project? It may not be a company, but let's just say your project and your community. It became sort of a, an open-ended problem. We've, the very first thing we did is we divided it into three events. We have a combat where we fight, fly, try to take out each other's ribbons, take out each other's airplanes is what really that becomes. We had unlimited, that's Reno inspired. Anything goes. Eventually we had to add some limits to that, but you know, it's around a bunch of aviators. And we had a stock category because at this point in time, the UMX, the Park Zone UMX airplanes started to become really attractive. They were simple, they were cheap, and they were little. And they, that brings your own kind of, their own problems. Check this out. That's the company president out there racing with us. That says a whole lot about the environment in which we work. So here's a, 
just to show you what this means, I'm just going to show you a quick little 10 second clip of what an air race start looks like, just to give you an idea of, of what, we're, what we're looking at here. Let's see. Okay, this is on your mark, get set, go. I think there's something like 15 airplanes in this and they're flying around the pylons. It's a hand launch kind of thing. And the idea is that you fly 10 laps and the first one through 10 laps wins. It's pretty simple. Here's a video of combat. This, I, I particularly like this video. I want you to keep your eye on the black one. The black one is gonna collect two more airplanes in its ribbon and haul around two airplanes in this. This, this one, uh, this is my favorite one. So watch that black one on the, on the kind of the left side of the screen in the middle there. Now it has two airplanes caught in its ribbon. There is 45 people standing there in full laughter on a work day being paid. We are doing model airplane races in our company. What, do you, what effect do you think this has to the morale of your company? What effect do you think this has to the quality of the project you're building with a bunch of other people? Well, let's first talk about how we simplified everything. We made a couple pylons, PVC pipe, 20 feet tall, 100 feet apart. I don't know if anybody has rules or if there's, you know, sanctioned air racing that does, the, that says, we just came up with these numbers because they fit the field that was outside the office. We do hand launch starts because landing gear complicate things and that's just extra work. We're trying to keep it simple. There's so many p airplanes in this picture and you always hand, you, you, uh, everyone hand launches on a command. So someone gets out and yells, ready, get set, go. This is purely fly fast, turn left inspired. Does anyone know where that comes from? Fly fast, turn left. Reno, he says. That's my boy. That's right, Reno. All of us are Reno fans. I mean, who isn't? That's the fastest motorsport there is. So we had to come up with some rules. This was very reluctant thing that we had to do, but we tried to keep it as simple as possible. And every time we would have some problem arise, like someone would show up with a gas airplane that went 120 miles an hour, it seemed a little dangerous. And so we had to kind of tolerate, you know, dial that back. The other thing too is we're flying on an active airport. And this is where our, the assistance and the, the help that AMA does with the lawmakers really came into play. We utilized the structure that they helped lay out with all of their government legislation about how to interact with airport and their governments. And they provided the framework by which we stay within the law and still have this kind of fun. That, I feel like we're forever indebted to the AMA for that. Is that made our relationship with the airport perfectly easy. We're still doing this, by the way. Um, so the racing is broken into two classes, stock and unlimited. And for stock, you know, we said, or for both of them, you have to be electric powered. You have to have a spotter. So you have to have someone who's counting laps for you. Ideally, not your friend, uh, but everyone picks their friend. Uh, let's see, all si simultaneously launched. And the penalty for cutting a pylon is you have to do another lap. It used to be a lap or a loop, but uh, people made airplanes that were so fast that a loop was a microsecond. So we had to make it where you had to add a lap to your, to your race. The point here is that minimal rules, and this is as complicated as it's ever gotten. In fact, I think we could delete some of these now. So what happened? What effect did we see for our company? What new reality did this management decision of giving us the half hour for free, just go out and do this, what happened? Emotional paycheck. The first thing that happened was everyone started feeling good about what they were doing and started getting even, look at the, these guys are holding their crashes and they're smiling about it. There's a crash in the middle of the road <laughs> that's, you know, a little bit dangerous in the row of cars, but you know, it's, it's, you have to assume that risk when you go out there. It raised morale for the company. There were so many people that would go out just to watch that didn't even fly. They had this, this desire to be out there among that group. And it was a time to let down and feel that energy increase. 
the, the interest in the hobby itself went nuts. Nearly everyone in the company had a model airplane sitting on their desk. We had shared charging stations in the office. We even had a lithium fire and the health and, and safety people had to come in and make sure that we were treating our lithium batteries correctly, you know, because the hole in the carpet in the office said that we didn't have enough time to run a burning battery out the door. So they put in little things, uh, little buckets of sand for us, you know, and they helped fix it up for us. There are 15 airplanes in this photo during a simultaneous launch. That, have you ever flown with 15, 14 other airplanes in the sky? It's chaos, and that's part of the fun. It created a familiar environment. We not only were flying with coworkers, we became friends. And to this day, these guys are consistently flying airplanes. We're very close friends, and that's who you want to work with is people that you know and get to know better on a friendly basis. They even formulated teams. And next thing you know, we had overall day at the RC field for work. Somehow, this little bit of competition breeds friendships in a deep way. And it, it continues all the time. As this kind of ebbs and flows and we get in and out of flying these air races, this is a consistent thing that we enjoy. Other people started to find an opportunity to hone their building techniques. Things like sneaking in carbon fiber into places to make it stronger and not telling anybody. These little tricks and it's, that is so incredibly enjoyable. It gives you a chance to be an artist. This guy is an airbrush artist and he can't draw this on our product at our company. We, this, I don't even know what this is, but he had a canvas and that's a random piece of art on our wall now. Had a good outlet for humor. It's kind of hard to see in this image, but there's a little picture of one of the manager's heads, like a side view of his head, and there's a boot kicking the back of his head. And so that was a joke for, you know, some, one of the managers, you know, was in this, you know, they got his picture, cut it out, and mounted it inside this airplane. Uh, you get to exhibit your best flying skills. That's why I put the picture of me down. We, just, we were trying to see if we could skim uh, Tundra tires across water with a model. It went awesome. <laughs> this is my favorite part of this. These air races give the opportunity to try the unconventional. This is an, a stock race with an unlimited race. And that's when the Kraken first came out from flight test. And so the guy in the middle there is flying a Kraken against me on the right, flying, uh, I think that's uh, Strega, the P-51 from Hacker, this old uh, EPP foam model. Those two in a race together, it was actually one of the tightest races we've ever flown. It was a lot of fun. Look at this, someone found Dusty the toy, took a UMX and put that radio in that airplane and flew that in the race. And it was terrible flying airplane, not good. Someone made a laser cut foam board aircraft carrier that had an RC car up in it that drove around the empty hangar that we tried to land night vapors on while he was driving around. These are professionals in a professional environment, engineering environment doing this. Uh, and uh, that thing would go fast. You could, get a, you could outrun a night vapor with this, you know, RC, uh, you know, aircraft carrier. Look at this, two radians put together. It works. You can bind those two to one transmitter. We didn't know that until we tried it. You know, this is kind of new for us too. Uh, the pond racer, that's a hand carved, I think Depron foam, but I'm not real sure what the fuselage foam is, but uh, that's Dan Craig with uh, uh, the boomerang, Burt Rutan's boomerang, flying it in the, uh, uh, in the races when the little brushless motors first emerged on the market. That was a hot airplane. Here's one that uh, has the nose of a radian with a folding propeller and one aileron, and then a, that flew miserably. But it's, again, it's an opportunity to try something, and it's a perfect environment in which to set, go head to head. And it's hilarious, too. There was even a guy who tried to do discus launch racing. He would throw it, do a lap, throw it again, do a lap, throw it again. There's 10 laps. This guy was exhausted by the time that this, this thing was over. But a spectacular discus launch pilot made me get into discus launch gliders. I had never seen this until this guy did this, and I became enamored with discus launch. 
Uh, down at the bottom, there's the Grizzly that is an old rutan design that's a uh, high lift and uh, uh, high CL and um, I think there's some other crazy things about it, but he made that out of foam board. It didn't fly fast. I put a bomb underneath my airplane and the idea was that we were gonna drop a bomb through the crowd of combat and all it did was just go straight down and explode, it just break in front of us. It was miserable failure. It was really fun though. Um, here's one where uh, uh, Dan Craig has built uh, White Knight 1 with Spaceship 1 with a ducted fan in it. So the ducted fan in the Spaceship 1 underneath provides the power and White Knight 1 is actually just a glider. So I would hold the controls for White Knight 1 and he would fly a spaceship. He'd give it power and we'd take off and a certain, when he'd say, okay, I'm ready, he'd pull the power and the Spaceship 1 would slide off the hook because now it's not making thrust. So it'd slide backwards for off the hook and then I would just fly White Knight 1 down like a glider, land it, has no power, and he'd zoom around with a ducted fan on Spaceship 1. That was a blast. We decided one time, let's, let's all get the same motor, the same speed control, and the same propellers and build twin engine airplanes. So you can build anything you want, but it's got to have two motors. And so here's our sor uh, sorted uh, twin motors that, uh, that we tried on one race. Um, that was especially fun because uh, I had uh, our friends from NASA Model Lab show up and race with us and, and fly their airplanes. That was a, a great time. Here's something weird. Uh, somebody bought a B-17 and it was sitting on their desk and uh, it was Brian Mazur had it sitting on his desk and he was gone and I kept looking at that thing thinking about, I don't know if anyone's ever seen the experiment where they mounted a giant radial engine to the nose of a B-17 and they tried some sort of propeller, I'm not really sure the story, but they tried some sort of propeller development and power plant development with it. And so he had crashed this B-17 and dinged the nose. So I designed a laser cut motor mount and put a Radian motor in the nose. So up at the upper right is the CAD model. And at the bottom is the laser cut parts put together. And it was a five motor B-17. And uh, that is the only picture I have of it because it did not work well. Uh, it made a lot of noise though, and it used a ton of battery, but it was worth it. And that's, that's the kind of thing that this is, this is about. Someone said, you know what? I'm gonna win the race by first person point of view, except that he had no frame of reference when he was out in the lead. So he would get out in the lead and not see anybody and feel like he needed to take his goggles off to look around and see where he was or if he was even still on course. So that didn't quite work out but uh, he ended up getting second place because he needed to see first place in front of him to know where to turn with, with, the, uh, with the camera. Sometimes combat requires critical thinking, like a battery fire in the middle of the flight. This was a day when the fire department came to watch us to see how safe we were while we were doing this, and we had the start of a grass fire. <laughs> so they came every time after that. Uh, it can be budget friendly. This is very inclusive to do at your workplace or on your project because this is a throw glider from Kmart and it's a few servos and, and some push rods and a cheap brushless motor and a little, you know, 1,000 or 1,200 milliamp hour battery. I put in and out decals on it just so I'd have a top from bottom kind of view. I'd, you know, just have something there. And every now and then famous people would show up. Do I have a laser? Famous people would show up like right here, this guy, that's Justin from the Model Lab. It was a big celebrity day that day when he showed up. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, this is one of the aspects of RC air racing with Burt Rutan. I think everyone here recognizes Burt Rutan's in this picture. He's a huge fan of model airplanes to this day. He would come to these every time. If he was in town, that's where he would walk out of meetings to go to these air races because this is the bread and butter of why we do this. And of course, status. A little status, it's fun. Look at this, we've got winner in the uh, unlimited on the left, Dan. We've got winner of combat in the middle, me. And then the winner of the stock race, Stan, on the right. Notice those little trophies we're holding? Look at this. Dano made these trophies with little IFOs and a, and a little plaque in the middle that kind of 
kept, you could keep this on your desk in your cubicle at work and people would walk by and know you won the race last week. And that just became a really fun thing to have. Pretty soon we were doing this so much that I started to collect a few of these inside my desk drawer and this is what kind of ended up happening. And uh, you know, so you, if you do this enough, you'll win a few times. So how far did this go? We saw this, this enthusiasm for RC increase. We saw the happiness level at work increase. Incidentally, after break time, we would see people's energy be up still. Instead of going to break and getting a little bit sleepy, they'd come back to work ready to go. Well, it created a whole community that started to fester within our little group. We started flying slope soaring after work. On top of this hill, we found a great place to fly uh, slope gliders. Here's a group of us flying one evening on a, a, right before the weekend starts. It, it, we would do it so much that the sun would set and we needed to still see the airplanes. And when you know, LED lights started to become really easy to buy and cheap, we would start putting them on our airplanes. Next thing you know, we tried to see who could fly the longest. Someone actually was able to wrap the timer on, a de on the new Spectrum radios when they started coming out with the, the timers that you could control and wrap them. They go to 99 minutes and I think 59 seconds is the maximum they'll go. And then they'll reset back to zero. And uh, that guy sitting in the chair had his reset three times without landing. So he had a, an incredibly long flight. He brought a dinner in the cooler next to him to see if he could stay up literally half the day. Look at this, 12 gliders in this image looking towards the east one night, looking, and that's over the town of Tehachapi, California, kind of near Bakersfield. It increased your flying skills because you're flying combat at work and you're flying race at work, and then you're flying gliders at night. So you're learning all the aspects of flying RC and you're getting time to practice in an environment that promotes it. Bettest of all, families are included. Every, both of my kids, looked forward to Friday afternoon because we ended up on the slope with a big group of people and we'd have picnics and have a good time. So we started camping out. Let's go to a dry lake bed. Here's a picture I took from a, a 222 glider flying over, I think this one is Coyote dry lake bed near Barstow. And we had a bunch of people with airplanes and campers and dirt bikes and model airplanes and hang gliders and paragliders. All these guys show up out there and we camp for a three day weekend, two nights and fly airplanes. How fun is that? All, this all started to happen after we started to put together these air races at work. Then the community started to get involved. We started to throw these events where we would get the biggest building we could find at the Mojave Airport and just have these silly little indoor um, free flight competitions. And that has bred so many friendships. And we've done this now for year after year. I want you to notice something. Here's, a, here's one, 2015, I think we started this in 2013. From 2015 to 2017, it grew. We have 100, the last time we did this in last April, of 2018, 126, I believe, is what we counted participating in this. And this is looked forward to by people around the entire area. We've had people come down from as far as the Vans uh, plant in uh, Oregon to participate in this. Then academia. Science, anyone here ever heard of Science Olympiad? They have a, a free flight competition and the idea is that you stay within these certain constructs, wingspan, weight, power, so they change it every year. You gotta build the longest duration free flight glider. The community, I am a proud member of Tatchby Crosswinds RC Club in Tatchby, and we have built our flying field together. We have built a community of our own flyers together. We're a pretty tight knit group. And uh, as we go, every, uh, over the years, we're just constantly improving our field and making it better for us, and it's becoming inviting to other people. The ultimate, the ultimate take home from this activity of flying RC at work, it's fulfillment, bottom line. It feels good, and that's why we do it, and that's why you should do it too. So that's my call to action to you, kids, adults. Do this at work. Come up with this idea. Try it. You'll be interested in seeing what happens and you will see an increase in overall fulfillment and overall happiness. And mark my word, 
it'll make you happier and it'll make you do more model aviation. So give it a try.